Okay, so Romans 10. Come on. Yep. Romans 10, I don't know that I've ever preached the gospel to somebody, you know, all the way through without going to Romans 10. We always go to 10, 9, and 10. This is how do they receive the gospel. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Um, you know, we tend to use that, obviously, as an instructional, like this is how you get saved. And there's nothing wrong with using it that way. It, it certainly fits. We're not taking it, we're not like uh, adding or taking away from God's Word by doing it that way. But as many of the verses in this series that we've seen, uh, the context is what we're looking at here. And the context shows us that actually this verse wasn't necessarily an instructional. He's not writing to them to, to instruct them. In fact, he's writing to save people, but it's, it's kind of like... In this point that he's making, he's saying, like, anyone who does this would be saved, whether Jew, Greek, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And actually what he's doing here is he's talking to the believers in Rome about his burden and his frustration with his fellow Israelites who as a nation have rejected the Lord. And so he's, he's kind of uh, dealing with, with this subject here. And, of course, we might have similar feelings to you know, our people, our kindred people, if you would like, look at, uh, you know, verse one there said, brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And we were kind of just joking around a little bit. Um, today I had, you know, it's been a while since I did this, but on the way up here, I said, would you mind marking my Bible for me? And so I'll, uh, say the verses and then they'll, uh, somebody in the in the vehicle will read them for me and then mark it and everything, which helps me kind of go through it in my mind as well as now it's marked. I can turn to it faster. And when we read that one, my heart, my desire and prayer for God, uh, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We were all like, amen, <laughs> like kind of joking because that's the big like Baptist thing. Like, yeah, Israel, we got to really focus on Israel. And I remember going to this church one time and, uh, and the guy was telling me that he... Uh, he said they were hurting financially, and they ended up continuing to hurt financially. But in his story, he was like, we were hurting financially, and this missionary came through. So I let him come speak, and he was a missionary to the Jews. And he was saying, God said he would bless the Jews. He took them to Genesis uh, 12, and he said, you know, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curse thee. And he's like, at the end of the message, he said, I just felt like, you know, if God wants me to bless the Jews, you know, and I agree with this, what better way to bless the Jews than preach them the gospel, right? I mean, that's true for anybody. And he said, well, so I, I think we ought to take this missionary on for, uh, you know, as a, as a missionary, even though we're hurting financially. And his claim was, and then God just blessed us for that because we were, and so like, it's a big, like independent Baptist thing to just like really focus and labor on Israel being God's people. But the thing is, there's a whole context here. There's all these, first, these, all these, there's all the chapters before that. There's the chapters after this. And actually what we see here is not like, you know, come on, everybody, your focus should be Israel. In fact, it's the opposite. It's like saying, you know, I, I, my desire is that Israel be saved, but then they, they've just rejected God. And so God's moving on uh, to a different, I don't want to say different program because anybody could have always got saved the same faith, but you know, in other words, he's focusing his attention away from that nation. That nation is going to end up getting scattered all among the earth. And, and uh, you know, as a, as a nation, they're not going to exist any longer. But I'm going to bring up a people from all nations who, who anybody who believes and calls on the Lord shall be saved. And, and so he's, he's just expressing here during that time, though, before 70 AD, before the scattering of Israel among the nations and all that, uh, you know, he is, he's still there and he's burdened. He's, he wants his people to get saved. And they're just now starting in this part of the, you know, the story in the book of Acts, just now starting to take the gospel to the other regions uh, beyond that local uh, Judea and Samaria. So, uh, so our desire might be just, you know, applying this to ourselves. It's not just about, oh, it's about Israel. You can't compare that to, you know, to modern day. Well, surely we can because my desire for I Iola is that they might be saved. You know, my heart's desire for Kansas City is that they might be saved. My desire for Allen County, you know, my desire for Kansas City or Kansas 
so that they might be saved. My desire for the United States is that they might be saved. As you know, our people, obviously, we have a burden for them. Our families, we have a burden for them. Our community, we should have a burden for them. But Paul's was very, um, very heartfelt, and I think partly was because he was such he was a religious leader among the Jews. He was a Pharisee, and so I think like he was just so conditioned to believe that we are. People. We are God's people. And then to see them, just like all the prophets in the Old Testament, to see them wander away from God brought them sorrow and grief. And so, number one, let's talk about his desire to get people saved. Okay, he says, My harsh desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's bad enough you know, that we would lack empathy for people who are suffering. I just preached this morning from uh, James chapter 5. And James chapter 5 says, you know, if you, uh, uh, if you, man, let's go there before, before I misquote it too bad. Let's go to James chapter 5. And he says uh, in verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And so that saving them from death isn't talking about eternal death. He's talking to believers, but he's saying, you know, this person is erred erred from the truth and you want to bring him back. And so, you know, I was talking about how our empathy, like, yeah, we have empathy when somebody's hurting and we want to help them. You know, you wouldn't see, you know, on the news, if somebody went into a burning building and rescued kids and dogs and whatever from the fire, you know, you wouldn't see this person probably saying, oh, yeah, I did such a great job because I'm a hero and all this. If they interviewed him, he would say, I'm not really a hero. I just did what anybody would do because, you know, our empathy as human beings should be like, I don't want to see people suffer. I don't want to know that I was stand, I stood here and watched as a as a baby died in the fire or, or whatever. And so we would naturally want to do something to help somebody. Well, how much more would we want to... Number one, see somebody saved, their eternal soul saved. It should, it should really, really cause us to sorrow to think about somebody dying and going to hell for eternity. And especially our loved ones, especially those, I mean, it should be the case for anybody, but it seems logical that we would really be burdened about our loved ones and family members and friends, neighbors. And so, you know, it, it stands to reason that we, like Paul, should have a desire to see our people saved. But Paul talks about here how he had this just continual sorrow in his heart. And we see that in his ministry as he's going about, you know, God called him to partic- particularly to go away from the Jews and go into the Gentiles. Like this was what his special calling was to do. And yet he continues to, to struggle and to go back. And, and he's constantly saying like, well, fine, I just wipe my feet of you and I'm going to the Gentiles. And then the next chapter, you see him right back preaching to the Jews again, which is fine. He, 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 we should preach to everybody and he wanted them to get saved. Uh, but he had this continual sorrow. And this starts in the context here in chapter nine, actually, you, be, you, you see the same uh, thing leaning, leading up to our text. Chapter nine, look at verse one and two. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Now I'm going to come back and finish his statement here in a minute. But you see what he's saying? He's like, you know, I, God is my witness. He's like, you know, I'm not telling a lie here. I would that I would be accursed for my brethren. Now, this is something that Moses did the same thing. Go back to Exodus chapter 32. You might already be aware of this, but Moses had a similar burden for his people. When God said He was going to destroy them and move on and and uh, and and not even save these people anymore like He intended to do, Moses it really burdened Moses' heart. And in Exodus 32, starting in verse 30, it says, "And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord." Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, 
if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. It's interesting, that little hyphen there, or whatever you call that little dash, uh, it's interesting, it's like, it's, it's like, how do you interpret that? It's like, if thou wilt forget their sin, and then there's just like this pause, and he says, and if not, it's almost like he knows God's going to judge them no matter what. And he's like, if not, blot my name. Uh, see, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And, and the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And so this idea that Moses is saying, like, take my life for their life and, uh, and, and kill me for them. You know, it seems to be some, something to what Paul is saying. Let me be accursed which essentially means, you know, let me go to hell in their place. Now, I can tell you this for sure. I have never felt that kind of compassion and empathy for somebody that I would say, you know what, I would rather go to hell so that you could go to heaven. You know, maybe that's bad, but I, I have never felt that way. And I would suspect nobody in here has felt that way because eternity is eternity. And I don't want eternity in hell. Okay, but Paul apparently sincerely believed you know, I love them so much. I want them to go to heaven. If it were possible, I would give my life and, and, and to the extent of being accursed so that they could go to heaven. Now, I could never ask, sincerely ask such a thing. I might, you know, I could probably say it just to sound good, knowing that God's not going to do it. But to sincerely in my heart want to do that. Uh, I, I couldn't do that. And, and maybe I would su suspect nobody in here would actually be willing to do that. Maybe you wouldn't be willing to go to hell, but would you be willing to give anything for the lost souls? I mean, would you be able to work at learning how to present the gospel till it's easy and you understand it and you can, you can present it at any time that you need to? I mean, that takes some work, yes, but that takes a lot less than being accursed for them, you know, that's, uh, but it takes some love and some like wanting people to be saved. And so I'm going to, I'm willing to, to learn how to present the gospel. Would you be willing to sacrifice some time each week to go soul winning? Would you be willing to endure some rejection? You know, cause you're going to have some rejection. Now, just this last week, I was, uh, you know, I actually several, many times I've said this to my soul winning partner. Like, did you ever stop and think like that person just rejected me, but they smiled when they did it. <laughs> They're like, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Have a nice day. And you're like, that was a rejection, but they were smiling and they were nice. And what are people afraid of? I mean, like how often do you actually get, you know, yelled at or the police called on your throat? Does it ever happen? Sure. But how, how often does that happen? Most of the time, you know, you're not really rejected. And if, if you, you know, the best case scenario, of course, you're going to be able to present the gospel and somebody's going to get saved. Now, we did have somebody uh, last week, wasn't it? I think it was Brother, <laughs> Brother Austin said they, they told him to go to hell, basically, like go to hell. Of course, he didn't want to, he didn't believe the, uh, the gospel, but he was just trying to be ugly. But you know what? You get to where that's nothing. That's nothing. I can bear a little bit of reproach for the cause of Christ. I mean, this is, this is really nothing that somebody would yell at me or uh, cuss me out or whatever. Uh, that's the least that I could sacrifice. It's not like I'm sacrificing my, my eternal soul to save somebody else's soul. I'm glad that we wouldn't have, we, we don't have to do that. So you see here that he has this desire that his people would get saved. Number two, he has a frustration that his people won't get saved. He has desire that they will get saved, but he has a frust frustration that they won't. And isn't it so frustrating, so frustrating that you would, you know, share the gospel. Like, like, like let's say your family, you know, you're telling them the gospel. You're like, Hey, I know, uh, you think I'm a little radical or something like that, but let me just tell you, and I praise the Lord that my family is all saved, but you know, you like, let me share with you the gospel. And they're like, ah, I don't want to hear that stuff or whatever. And the, just the grieving that you would have, uh, we had, uh, I didn't make a big deal about it this year. I, I kind of forgot, but, um, but I was intending to this year do back what we did last year. I believe it was last year where they did the secret, uh, not secret Santa, but secret soul winner. <laughs> and the idea was, you know, there are always people, there, there are always people in your life that won't listen to the gospel from you. It's because your family member or something like that. They just, you've already preached to them maybe, and they won't listen to you. So the, the idea was submit one of those names. Here's somebody that that I want them to hear the gospel, but they won't hear it to me, and then have somebody else 
go and knock on that door and try to preach the gospel to them. And that's always something we can do. We don't have to have a special occasion for it, but that's always something that we can do is get somebody else to go because, you know, you're, it's so frustrating that they won't listen to you. So they're like, maybe they'll listen to you. Why don't you go and preach the gospel to them? <clears throat> you know, uh, people at the door when you go soul winning, so frustrating. I mean, the most annoying thing in the world to me, like the thing that troubles me the most is when, you know, they just told you. Oftentimes they believe in God. They believe in the Bible. Supposedly they say that they do. They believe in heaven and hell. And you say, well, you think you're going to heaven when you die? I don't know. Probably not. I probably go to hell right now. Well, let me show you from the Bible why you don't have to. No, that's okay. I got to I gotta go eat dinner. <laughs> and it's just like, ah! if you really believed you were going to hell, why wouldn't you stop and listen to me and give the gospel to you? And so you can see just by the little bit of frustration we have, what Paul was no doubt going through as he, as he is continuing to preach the gospel to people who are stoning him with stones, kicking him out of uh, the, the cities there, locking him up in prison, and doing all these things, and just that frustration that they wouldn't receive the gospel. Now, God had already prophesied numerous times about the nation of Israel. In, uh, in Iola, we've gone through Ezekiel a while back, last year, I guess, the beginning of last year. We went through, maybe we finished up, then I can't remember. But we, uh, we're going through Ezekiel, and, uh, and we just recently are going through Hosea. I'm still working my way through that. We're in chapter 9. And as you go through all these prophets, it's just like continually. Like, you rejected me. This is just God speaking through the prophets, and He's saying, you rejected me. You've went after other gods. You've, uh, you've, you've sacrificed in, unto the wrong gods and gone into high places and all these different things. You've disobeyed all my commandments. And he's just going after him, going after him. And then he's constantly saying, like, I'm not going to have mercy. I keep reaching out my arms to you and you won't hear me. And, and he's like, basically, I'm done with you. I'm not going to show mercy. Tonight I'm talking about how he's going to, from Hosea 9, he talks about how he's going to punish the children. And that sounds like a harsh thing. And of course, I'll explain it's not necessarily punishing the children because of the parents' sin, but the result of sin being passed down to the kids. And, and, uh, and, it, and it's just so, uh, so frustrating. And so we, we, you know, God had already told the children, uh, I mean, told the, the prophets that the children of Israel were going to reject. So he begins to say that, look at Romans 10 again. He begins to talk about some of this. I'm going to do this real quick. Uh, starting in verse 16. I know it looks like we just jumped to the end, but we're, we'll come back and look at some of those other verses. Starting in chapter 16, here, here's the kind of conclusion that Paul comes to. And he begins to quote a bunch of Old Testament scripture. We're going to go look at those scriptures. Okay, He says, But they, this is verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Now that's the memory verse that we've been doing. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord uh, revealed? And so look at the next part he says there in Romans 10. He says, But... Um, so then in faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the earth. Look at Psalm, uh, one, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. This was prophesied way back in the days of David. He says, And the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language which their voice is not heard, where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the earth. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the earth, and his circuit unto the ends of, ends of it, and there is nothing hid 
from the heat there. So the beginning part of that, he's talking about the heavens declaring the glory of God. He says, you know, there's, there's no, the, his line has gone out. How did he say it? The line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the earth. So look, everybody is without excuse. And so the nation of Israel was definitely without excuse because they had the oracles of God, uh, you know, give it to them the, directly from the mouth of the prophets. They have no excuse. He says in uh, Isaiah 65, the next part here, let me go to verse, uh, verse 20 in our text. He says, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them, and they sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So let's look at Isaiah 65. Verse 1, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not call, called by my name. And if you look at all the Old Testament prophets, it was pretty clear that this is what was going to happen. You know, God was going to reject those people who constantly rejected him, and he was going to turn his attention to this nation that was not a nation. And this is brought out really clear in our text and in other of Paul's writings. We'll come back to one of those in a minute. But now go to uh, uh, verse 2. It says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. So back to Romans chapter 10. Here's what he says in verse 21. But, uh, but to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So even Paul just quoted four, five verses f straight from the Old Testament. I, I think I left some out. He said uh, in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 19, he talks about this quote. And he says that God would provoke them to jealousy. And so there's like five different verses here that he quotes, basically, that Paul quotes, basically saying, you know, God's already said that he's done with my people because they won't listen to him and he's going to he's gonna reject them. And, and he, he told us he was going to go to a different people, a nation that was not a nation. So it seems like Paul understands this. And if you go back to chapter 9 again, remember that's part of this context as we get into, uh, finish it up with chapter 10. But part of the context, look at verse 6. So he started, remember, saying, I have heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I wish that I could, uh, I myself could be a curse from Christ for my brethren. Now look at starting in verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. It's like he's saying, okay, it's, it's, not like, it's not like I shouldn't have already seen this coming. It's not like I shouldn't already know. And of course, we read some of those verses in chapter 10. He says, For they're not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy children be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh... These are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither have done uh, any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. And so you see here, he's making it real clear that, you know, it's not like God didn't already say that this was going to happen. It's not like, you know, God didn't already prophesy. How many times in the Old Testament do we see these stories where the, the older is supposed to get the blessing, but what happens is, it's, it's taken away from him and it's given to the younger. It happens over and over again. Jacob and Esau is the story that he's talking about here. And these are all pictures of what's going to happen. Jonah is a good example as well. Jonah is told us to preach the gospel to Nineveh. And then whenever Nineveh is spared, he's, he's upset about it. And that's exactly what the Jews did. Like they're responsible for, you know, basically... Christ, the Word of God and then Christ coming into the world. And then all of a sudden it's just like Christ, you know, saves the, the quote unquote bad people. And now, now that they're all upset about it. And so he provoked them to jealousy, as he said in Deuteronomy 32. 
It seems like Paul understood that there was a, just going to be this remnant, this small remnant of people who were Jews who would be part of uh, saved people. You know, and there's always a remnant of every people. It's, a small, it's going to be a small portion. The Bible says few are saved. So, you know, we could talk bad about the nation of Israel all day. Right now, looking back on it, and we could say all these bad things about them, and we could say that, you know, look how they rejected God, and look how they, uh, you know, even though the evidence was right there in front of their face, they rejected them. But come on, we can look at the whole world and say, it's t- right today, right now, we can look at the nation of the United States and say, what has happened to the people? That, you know, they sh- they, they've had the Word of God sounded all throughout the land. They've had the preaching. They've had the Bibles. we got Bibles galore in the United States, and yet they're rejecting Him. And so the preachers from the United States should be, man, this is just burdening my heart. It's just I have a desire. Not only do I have a desire that they be saved, I'm so frustrated that they won't get saved, frustrated that they won't listen, they won't understand the simplicity of the gospel and just trust the Lord and His righteousness. But as it says in chapter 10, they keep going after their own righteousness. Because we all know that you know nine times out of ten or more, why do what do people think is going to get them to heaven? Doing good works, being good, loving your neighbor, going to church, getting baptized. They think these are the things that are going to get them into heaven. And what are they doing? They're, they're establishing their own righteousness. Let's see, how, how does he say that in verse 10? For Verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, I kid you not, I went ahead and looked up a commentary because there was something in particular I was trying to see what other people say about this. And this guy, uh, I don't even remember what commentary it was, but this guy said they have submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And you know what he said? He said, see, it's not enough just to believe in the Lord. You've got to submit yourself unto the righteousness of God. (laughs) And I'm looking at this like, did you even read the verse? Because what this guy's basically saying is like, you have to have God's righteousness. And I'm in agreement that you have to have God's righteousness. But you know what God's righteousness is? It's his righteousness. It's not mine. I can't get to heaven on my own righteousness. The Bible's very clear on that. And so he's saying they've submitted themselves to their own righteousness and not the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness, uh, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Believing on Jesus Christ and his righteousness, the righteousness of God, that's what gets us saved. It's not by uh, trying to do our own righteousness. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Right? So you want to keep the law? You want to get to heaven according to the law? Well, fine. Keep every single letter of the law. Don't offend in one point and you'll go to heaven. But guess what? There's not a soul on this earth that's ever done that. And so he says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. And then he gives the famous verse, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For at the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Which righteousness? The righteousness of God. <laughs> and, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Uh, now I remember as a kid, you know, I don't remember if I came up with this on my own or if someone else said it, but I used to think that he said, Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And right here where it says that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, I thought that meant if you're saved, you won't be ashamed to go preach the gospel and to tell people like and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And I would say that that should be the case. You should be able to do that. But that's not what this verse is saying. He's saying like, you know, you won't be ashamed basically on judgment day. You know, I believe is the context here. He's saying whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. Uh, you know, you, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry about because you believed on the righteousness of the Lord. For there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. For the same Lord is over all. Same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall not perish. I mean, so whosoever ble- whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so here's the last thing that I want to point out. So we've got the desire. This is Paul's desire that his people get saved. 
his frustration that they won't get saved. All right, this is the natural process of every soul winner. Number three, the inability to do anything that would make people get saved. Okay, the thing is, we know this, we can't make anybody believe. We can preach the gospel, we can hope they believe it, and, uh, and all those who do will accept the righteousness of God. As I already pointed out, the, the, the righteousness of God who sent His Son to pay for our sins, uh, through His righteousness we can be saved. That's what we're trusting and that's what we're putting our faith in. And they will hear the gospel when it's preached, if they're of faith. Okay, if they're going to believe in it, they'll hear the gospel and then they'll put their faith in it and they'll call on the Lord to save them. You know, you say, well, what are all the details? What will that look like? Will a person's life change? What exactly are they going to pray? Do they have to say a prayer? People make this so difficult. But the thing is, you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You preach the righteousness of God. Those who trust in that gospel, they're going to believe it. And they're going to confess with their mouth that they believe that. And they're going to call on the Lord to save them. However you want to define that, the thing is, it all has to do with faith in what God did for us, not establishing our own righteousness. And uh, it's, it's calling on the Lord and believing in our, in our heart. So, and of course we already know this, all we can do is what it says in verse 14 and 15. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good joy. So I think I, I think we've went through every verse now, just kind of in a weird order. But here's the bottom line, okay? What shall we do? How can we, you know, it's so frustrating people don't get saved. It's so, we, we want so badly for everybody to get saved. Every door we knock on, every person we talk to, we want them to get saved. Frustrating that they're not getting saved. So what can we do about it? Uh, well, here, here's all we can do about it. We can, first of all, be sent into the world. Okay, how shall they uh, preach except they be sent? Unfortunately, you know, a lot of churches, even Baptist churches, even independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, they're not sending people out to go preach the gospel. It's so crazy. Now, they, they'll, they might be sending missionaries out, but then those missionaries, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of those missionaries are doing the same thing that their pastors are doing in the States. And that is they're just sitting there thinking of ways to, to get a big service so that people will come into the church so that they can get saved. And it's like, wait a minute. How are they going to preach unless they're sent? We need to send people out into the world to preach the gospel. And if that's not happening, people aren't going to get saved. We just had a girl today. This is it's just uh, blows my mind how many times somebody will come to our church and they'll travel a long distance. And uh, we had a girl come to Iola today from uh, from Wichita. This is like the third person that's come from Wichita and said, said we just just can't find people out there that are doing the work and that the and preaching the right doctrines and all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying that can't be true. There's got to be. There's so many churches there. There's got to be people that are doing it. But these people are telling me, well, not not by our opinion. And so they're coming down here. And it's like you know, one of the big things that they always say is that nobody's going out and preaching the gospel. You know not going out and preaching the gospels. They want to be part of a church that's actually sending people out, knocking door. Now, yeah, they could go just do it on themselves by themselves, but isn't it nice to be part of a church that actually has the times and sends people out and they go do this together? All right, so the first thing we have to do is be sent out into the world. A lot of churches aren't doing that, unfortunately. Okay, number two, when we are sent out, what do we do? We, we preach the gospel. How can they hear without a preacher? We need to not just go into the world and invite people to church. But we need to go and actually preach the gospel to them. They've got to hear the gospel. You know, it's all right to invite them to church. That's not necessarily wrong. But, you know, what is most important for them is that they hear the gospel because they're more, you know, there's a very likely chance, most likely, that they're not going to come to church and, uh, and preach to them the gospel. And then the final thing we can do is lead those who believe to call upon the Lord. You say, well, I just don't understand. You should, you know, you just go around trying to lead people in a prayer. No, we don't. We try to go lead people in a prayer that believe. <laughs> and if they believe, we lead them in a prayer. So they have an opportunity to call on the Lord to, to, to save them. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? I, you know, it, it's possible that somebody would lead them in a prayer. I know it's happening for 
and they didn't truly get saved. But, you know, we're still doing our job because they believed it. We're given an opportunity to call on the Lord. We don't know what happens to them, but we've done our part. We've gone into the world. We've preached the gospel, and, uh, and we've allowed those people who believe to call on the Lord. This is, again, not an instruction. It's just like, in a, just like a, a, a byword, kind of just Paul is just saying, like, you know, anybody, Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter if they, if they believe and they call on the Lord, they'll get saved. And so he's just, he's just bringing that down. It's so frustrating that his people aren't getting saved. He's like, if they would just believe in their heart and call on the Lord, they would get saved. And so that's all we can do, you know, and it's going to be frustrating. And we need to continue to have the desire that people get saved. Don't let that fire go out in your heart. And, uh, and even though it's going to be frustrating, what we need to do is, you know, continue to preach the gospel, even though we can't make people get saved. And so the Bible uh, gives us this great passage of scripture. We use it almost every time we go soul winning and it's a good passage. And we can see also in the context, the heart of Paul and the heart of every soul winner and what it should be. Okay. Uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, we thank you that uh, you've saved us. Thank you that you've given us mouths and the abilities to go out and preach the gospel to other people. Lord, help us not take that for granted. I pray that you also, as we do that and continue to do it and do it so frequently, that we wouldn't lose sight of the burden and the passion uh, and the just desire to, to win souls. And I know that it's, it, it's so frustrating to us when people don't get saved. I can only imagine how frustrating it is to you who have sent Jesus into the, uh, to the world to, uh, to provide salvation to the world, and he's just been rejected. It's no wonder, Lord, that your wrath is kindled against those people who reject him, and, and ultimately there will be eternal, uh, eternal suffering in the lake of fire. Lord, I pray that you will be uh, merciful while we're on this earth and continue to preach, and, and you'll uh, give us every opportunity to, to lead people to the Lord. Help us not to get weary in well-doing, but to continue to do that for your honor and glory. And we pray you'll bless the ch this church and the work as we seek to do that. And you'll receive the glory for it in Jesus' name.